I'd like to preach you a message entitled, Assurances and Understandings in Different Stages of Your Christian Life. Assurances and Understandings in Different Stages of Your Christian Life. We are preaching through the book of 1 John. You hear many pages going, so if you didn't know that, now you know. 1 John, toward the end of your Bible. In chapter 1, as we preached through 1 John, uh, we saw two Uh, proofs and assurances of salvation, one going into chapter two. So the one, the first one was this. These are, these are proofs, evidences uh, of salvation that really bring assurance in your own heart. And and so chapter one told us this, taught us this. If you, if you walk in the light uh, as God is in the light, that gives evidence that you know him. And uh, we, we kind of debunked some of the thought of what it means to walk in the light. It's not being sinless, I mean, there's not one person here that is sinless. Amen? Yes? Okay, okay. This, this is not, Christians are not sinless, all right? We are, we are sinless, sinless by forgiveness and by pardon, by the precious blood of Christ. But practically, we, we come to God filthy sinners. And that starts with the guy on the pulpit, all right? I'm not, and that's what it means to walk in the light. You're not hiding your sin. You're not hiding in the shadows. You are pronouncing, you're admitting it, you're confessing it, you're saying the same thing that God says about your sin first in salvation. I am a sinner. I need forgiveness. I, I want to turn away from what damns me, what I agree with you, what your Bible says, your word says, what is sin and what is not sin. I come to you as a sinner. I don't hide. I walk in the light. And then we found that after you come to the light in salvation, then you'll continue in the light. And that's, that's evidence, that's proof, that's assurance of you being saved as well. You know, a, a believer is not someone, or a born-again believer is not someone who lives perfect every day, but, but one, a mark of their life, evidence of their life, assurance of their life, is that they are continually, openly uh, confessing their sin before God. You're not in salvation anymore. That's settled. But as far as in a fellowship, like a, a child and a father. And uh, that, that's the first proof, assurance of salvation we saw. Then we plunge into chapter 2. And we saw a second proof or assurance, and that is if you keep his, Jesus, commandments. And there's been quite a lot of stir about the 49 commandments that, you know, and I, let me tell you again, okay, it's some, some people count it as 50 or 51 or 52, but the 49 commandments, we posted those on the blog, on the internet, if you want to look at them again. I mean, here's 49 things that Jesus commanded, and it is evidence that you are saved, that you are truly a Christian, if you have a lifestyle of 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 obeying Christ. I already said, obviously, that that doesn't mean you're sinless. It means that there is a continual, a constancy that you are a follower day after day uh, obeying the commands of Jesus Christ. That is, let's say it this way, the mission statement of your life. Then we saw proof number three, and that is uh, evidence number three, if you love others. That was last Sunday night. Okay, if you love others, that is, you don't hate your brother which we just defined, who is my brother? It's all men, all women, okay? So it is characteristic of the believer that there is not hate in him. Why? Because the love of God dwells in him, the love of Christ, the love that came from Christ. And so he, he cannot hate. He, you know, we get into situations where, you know, we uh, are offended or, whether, or, or someone comes against us, whatever. There's that momentary whatever. But a true believer doesn't continue that hate. A, a true believer resolves that. A true believer is willing to forgive. True believers have God's love in them and they don't hate others. With these assurances, then, as our context of where we come from, would you stand, please, and let's read together 1 John chapter 2, beginning of verse number 12. We we hear a couple of verses now that almost seem like poetry. And in fact, depending on who your publisher is of your Bible, he may have he may have squared it up as poetry. He may have actually, the whoever the publisher was, may have made it um, kind of look differently as he printed it in the type. Some of you have Bibles that made it look that way. So is this poetry? Here we go. First John chapter 2, beginning of verse number 12, says this. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake, for Jesus' name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you have, you, ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. And of course, that's Satan. I, I write unto you, little children, Because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have 
written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Now, jump to verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard, the Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby ye know that it is the last time. Wow, if he said that, you know, 2,000 years ago, it is the last time. How much more is it the last time in 2015? You may be seated. Now, what, is, what, what are these verses from 12 to 14? It's some kind of poetry. What does it mean? I want to show you some op- opening observations, and I think it's going to make it a, a lot clearer for us. We only have one slide today. Guys, throw it up there, okay? I want you to notice this will help you a lot in your, in your translation. You notice, to clarify right away, the words little children in the different spots that I read are not the same word, Greek word, little children. Again, we praise God for the Greek manuscripts that make our understanding clear in our translation. The little children in verse number 12 is the word technion, which means a birthed one or, or anything that is birthed, one born. Or in this case, generally uh, talking about all believers who are born again. Okay, this is, this is the same little children if you look down at your Bibles, as is used in verse number one of chapter two, meaning all Christians, it's pretty common in, in the New Testament to, to, to say it this way. We are the children of God to, to say, to address the technion, okay, to, to address all believers this way. Now notice the other little children's in verse number 13 and in verse number 18. This is a different word altogether. It is the word paideia. And you, if you say that over and over, you kind of recognize something that we spend a lot of time with in the Whitmer household, and that is pediatrics, okay? Pedia, pediatrics comes from this word, the care of children, or the word padawan comes from this word as well. Some know what that means, some don't. This word refers to younger children, younger children, Okay? Uh, you see, in a moment, you're going to see why these distinctions, these are, these are toddlers' age, you know, these are elementary, you know, younger children. All right, you're going to see why this distinction is very important in a moment. And so, when you look back over it, if you understand what the slide means, there's really four groups being addressed, not three, okay? Four groups being addressed. The first one is addressing, the first little children addresses all believers, okay, everybody in the room. But then from that point on, there are really three stages, and I'm going to kind of blow it right now, just give you, you know, exposed with the deal. There are three stages of your Christian life, three stages of growth. So first, he's going to address all believers, and then he's going to talk about three specific uh, stages of Christian growth. I want you to notice something else in opening. That is that six times here, John, obviously the Holy Spirit writing through John, says something like, I write unto you, or I've written unto you. If you look down, scan your Bible, not me, you know, the Bible, 12 through 14, and then verse 18, you know, so four, excuse me, six times there, he is saying over and over and over, I write unto you, I've written unto you. Well, what reason is he saying that over and over? Is it just poetry? I mean, why is he saying over and over, I write you, I, I, I've written unto you? Well, he, he's, he's repeating something so that they will get it. He says, I'm, he's saying, like, I'm telling you something. I'm repeating it to assure you. Uh, recognize what I'm trying to tell you. And so he's saying, I write unto you. I've written unto you. I write unto you. I write unto you. He's, he's trying to assure them. He's trying to, to tell them something. Imagine, imagine the, the I write or the I have written here six times, like someone telling you, I'm telling you this. I'm telling you this. I'm telling you this. Listen to me. This is really too true. I assure you of this. So he's telling them six times that so they really get it. So what? Had he written, he says, I write or I have written. Okay, it's not the information in the verses. What is it that he wrote to them six times, or excuse me, what, what did he write to them that he's referring to that this is what I wrote to you. I've written to you in order to assure them. What is he talking about? Well, I think it's how we started today. It is all those proofs and evidences in the book of 1 John. Is, and we're, we're not stopped. There's a bunch more as we clear the book of 1 John. He says, I'm, I write, I've written these things to you so you'll, you'll know it for the sake of, we already told this, said this last week, for the sake that believers will be assured. 
I, I've, I've written these over these proofs, these evidences. I am writing to you to assure that you that you are saved. I'm telling you this so that you'll have confidence and you'll recognize, humbly recognize that these evidences, these assurances are true in you. And I want to point out something about where you are in your Christian life. So he say, I write unto you, and he, and he says these three groups, you know, fathers, you know, young men, and little children. I, I, I want to, I write unto you to assure you, you know, you're saved, be confident in that, but there's something that you ought to know as you continue as a Christian. In each point in your Christian life, there's something, there are characteristics that you need to understand in order to be the, the greatest Christian that you can be in the stage that you're in. We see here fathers, young men, and little children, the three stages of maturing, and it's, it's in reverse order, okay? So he's talking about mature believers first, and then like semi-mature believers, middle age, you know, uh, middle age spiritually, Christians, and then, and then kind of new believers. The fathers are very mature. The young men are folks that have been saved a while. They have grown stable in their faith. And we see here little children. The last one, these are, these are new believers, baby believers, maybe only been saved for a while, or... The other people that would be in this group are people that have been saved a long time, just have not grown properly. You know, immature Christians, you know, believers that never continue to grow, never continue to become like the Lord Jesus Christ, become stable like young men, and then ultimately fathers. They're still mature. The Christian life, folks, is about growth. All right, there's a, there's a wrong thinking out there in, in, in conservative places. The Christian life is about, are you right with God? Are you wrong with God? You're right with God now. You're wrong with God. And what ends up happening in that kind of preaching is you're always getting right with God every Sunday. Well, that's not what the Christian life is about. The Christian life is continual growing to be like Christ. And that's natural as a believer to grow through one stage to start as a young baby believer and then continue and then to continue as you grow to become strong like a young man and then, and then eventually as a very wise and godly mature believer filled with the, the fruits of the Spirit. After we are saved, our changing is like growing. God doesn't teach us everything in one amazing kabam flash of maturity. Wouldn't that be great? You get saved one day and later on in the afternoon, ba-bam, you're just like Jesus. Now, that's what happened to Pastor Pritt, but the most of us, that didn't happen too. That's a little joke because his family is here. Points for Whitmer, bang. <laughs> no, we grow through the influence of learning Scripture. That's why we go to Sunday school. That's why we listen to the Word of God. That's why we meditate on the Word. We chew it up. We, we grow through... Uh, Spiritual leaders counseling us, teaching us, confront us. We, we grow through hardships. How many of you have grown through hardships in your life? Yes. I got saved because I thought all my problems would go away. Yeah, that, helped, that, that worked for all the disciples that got killed, got murdered. Martyred, yeah, it was, really worked out for them. That's a joke, okay? They're happy now. They're not, you know, they're in heaven with the Lord. We learn through, we grow through decisions of life. Making the right ones, making the wrong ones. We grow over time. This is called progressive. That's the word progressive. Progressive sanctification. And I think it's very good for you to think of your Christian life and maturity this way, over time. But time isn't the only factor. The truth is there are many older Christians that are very immature still because they have not grown properly. It's kind of like the whole thing, like you, you try, you know, whatever you try to do. I remember one summer as a teenager, me and Scott Phillips who were coming in July, we, we decided we were going to become professional tennis players. You know, we were like 14, 15. And so we, we actually played tennis like all day long, almost one entire summer, every day, whatever. Well, here's the point of that. You know, if you can do something for a long time, but it doesn't mean you're doing it right. You understand what I'm saying? You just, you know, experience doesn't mean you're wise. You may have done something a very long time and done it wrong. You know, and I apply that to immature believers who've been saved a long time. How, how we mature is based on factors such as are we meditating in the word, not just time. Factors like are you applying the word that you're meditating in or in the word that you hear preached? You know, do you go away from every sermon with something to apply to your personal life? You need to. Okay, uh, it, factors like how do you respond to chastening when it comes? 
If God is just teaching you the same lessons of chastening time after time after time, it's because you're not learning the lessons. Okay, and he has to repeat them in your life. And, 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 and it also has to do with how we add to our faith godly virtues. You know, we have faith. We, we, we trust that Christ as our Lord and Savior. Okay, now are we adding to the faith those virtues that the scripture talks about? It also has to do with how well we learn the lessons God sends us on a daily basis and bear the fruit of the Spirit. So when we see this passage here that we're going to plunge into, it is like John is saying, I'm writing these things to assure you, since you have the proofs and evidence of salvation, that these are the critical things that you need to understand in the different stages as, that you grow as a Christian. And he gives, these, he gives like a, a comment after each, you know, he, he addresses each of them two times, and he gives comments after he mentions the name of fathers, people who are mature in the faith, people that are in middle age in the faith, you know, young men, you know, you're strong, whatever, and then little children, and we, we learn from this. We, before we see these three stages, you see that he addresses all of us. Look at verse 12. He says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake, for Jesus' name's sake. So he starts by addressing all of us. Because your sins are forgiven you, for his name's sake. It is foundational in my Christian growth and in your Christian growth for every believer to know, to be assured, to rest in the knowledge that your sins are really forgiven. To know it more than the paper of your Bible, to know it in your heart and in your mind. As your pastor, I can never take a, a statement of assurance like that for granted because the devil is always a liar. And he's always trying to get you to believe his lies. And one of the biggest things that he wants to you to believe and to feel guilty about and to paralyze you is this question about are you really forgiven or the past things you have done that are horrendous, are they really forgiven in the blood of Jesus Christ? What is really my standing? And I'm talking from the inside of your brain. I'm talking from your heart, which most of you understand exactly what I'm talking about. The devil loves to lie and to paralyze you that way. And it's foundational for your growth, as John lays out here, that you know that you really are assured that your sins are forgiven. I don't mean that you need to do more. Christ is enough. I'm not saying you need to do some other religious act at all. I'm saying that you need to rest in the truth. He says, your sins are forgiven. You see that little word, are there, in your Bible? Are forgiven, verse 12. He says, are forgiven instead of were forgiven. Does that hit you strange? It should. He says, are forgiven instead of were forgiven or your sins have been forgiven. Like we would normally speak, like I would speak. It, and, and I'm just throwing out some grammar here. That's a, the word are is a perfect indicative tense, which means it's something, check this out, that happened in the past that has ongoing effects forever. Your sins are started in the past when you trusted Christ continues today tomorrow till the day that you are with him in heaven forever you are forgiven you are forgiven through your wonderful advocate and propitiation Jesus Christ I think there's some people need to wake up here and realize the joy of this the amazing truth we are forgiven it's not that we just were forgiven. I think if, if he had written were forgiven here, see that lets, that's a, that's the devil have a little bit of opening because then some of you are going to reason, okay, the, the sins of my past are forgiven, but perhaps not what I do today or what I do tomorrow. And that doubt creeps in again. No, he says are forgiven. Perfect, ongoing forgiveness that results in you being clean and clear from the moment you trusted Jesus Christ, day by day by day by day, that moment on, clear through eternity, you are forgiven. That's good stuff. What does that mean, little children? Talking about all born-again ones here? It means that you can move on and grow in closeness to God and in becoming like Jesus because you are really washed, you are really clean, you are really without spot in the eyes of God. You really, really are. You can draw near to him, and you can be assured that he'll draw near to you. Now, most of the time, why we struggle with this lie is that the thoughts are about me. So why the devil gets advantage over a believer in the idea of forgiveness is it's, it's usually about me. You know, things like, I don't deserve it. 
or, or why me? Or that can't be true. I, I know my sinfulness. And, and even though there's these words like grace and mercy and pardon and justification, you still can't get past you, all right? Well, then, well, look at the last four precious words of verse number 12 and blow that out of the water. It says, would you read it out loud for me, please? For his name's sake. Let's just do it again. For his name's sake. The Bible says we are forgiven for his name's sake. Ain't got nothing to do with you. It's for his name's sake. What do I mean? Well, it doesn't mean through Jesus' name. The words for his name's sake here about the reason you're forgiven doesn't mean, you know, through the cross, through the resurrection, okay? It's saying something else. Forgiveness isn't about you or what you deserve or whether you qualified yourself or whatever. All of us deserve hell. Let's just say it straight out, okay? We all have violated the commands of holy God. We all deserve that without a question, but forgiveness has been granted to us for Jesus' namesake, or in other words, for Jesus' glory because of him, He's getting himself glory when he puts on display the love and mercy and grace that it takes to save you, the rascal. To save you, the rabid sinner. And I include myself, I'm calling myself a rabid sinner. Okay, when that happens, when what he did on the cross and the resurrection is applied to you because you believe it, then he gets himself glory that is going to last throughout eternity. He is exalted for being the one who saves, not because of anything that people do, not because they qualified or they're worth saving, but because of what he did in his characteristics of mercy and love and grace. He gets himself the glory. When you come to the place of realizing this, that Jesus receives great exaltation for what he did in forgiving you, you can stop thinking about yourself. You can stop letting the devil have advantage of you by his lie. You can stop meditating on your unworthiness and focus on his worthiness and the glory that he receives. And you can continue to grow. And you can flourish. And you can blossom. And you can abound because you know that he is getting the glory because he forgave you and you're in the state of you are forgiven. So John addresses all born ones, all the saved, uh, with that assurance to be settled and full of rest in the fact that we are forgiven. And I say to that, amen, glory to Jesus' name. May he receive the praise and glory and adoration. None of us deserve it. Praise him. Thank you. Get yourself glory. May your name ever be exalted, Jesus Christ, throughout eternity. And with that assurance then, in verse number 12, given to each, of all, each and all believers, John begins addressing Christians in this, these three stages of Christian maturity. And you'll notice, as I've said already, that he says two things to each of them. Okay, he says two things to each of them. Okay, number one, fathers. Look at verse number 13. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. Skip to 14, what he says about fathers. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning, the exact same thing. I think we can be sure who the him is that the Father's talking about. It's not talking about all the Godhead. It's not talking about the Holy Spirit. It's not talking about the Father. It's specifically talking about Jesus. We know that him that was from the beginning is talking about Jesus because the opening lines of this book, that which was from the beginning, and it was talking about Jesus Christ. Okay, he is saying to fathers, be assured. Realize in your maturity, in your Christian life, that you have known Jesus. You have known the one that is from the beginning. He says this exact thing twice to fathers. He assures them that they have known. This is, this is the word that he uses for knowledge. There's different words for knowledge in the New Testament. The one he uses for knowledge here isn't the one that comes from intelligence. It's not like reading a book and knowing something. It is a relationship and a familiar knowledge of Jesus that he's talking about. You have relationally, you have known him. But I don't want you to also, when I say that, think of do 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 you know, like, like this, you know, kind of weird kind of thing. It's not a five senses kind of knowledge that he's talking about. Jesus is the one, the Bible says, who having not seen, we love. Or, or it's not about five senses that we know him. It is a faith thing, but 
It's a knowledge of faith and unexplainable connection that the Holy Spirit draws within us to to know Jesus, to love Jesus, to adore Jesus, to acknowledge that he is the only Savior, to be thankful for him, to worship him. And that is the knowledge that mature believers grow strong in over time in their Christian life. And we see that. If you have a mature believer, I'm not talking about age, I'm talking about spiritually mature believer, you can see that the most important thing to him is his relationship with Jesus. He's come to know that. That faith becomes so strong that your love for Christ exceeds your love for anyone else more than a spouse, more than a best friend. You know and love Jesus. Now why would, why would he address mature believers about that? I mean, that seems kind of elementary. You know, why is he, why is he specifically addressing fathers? You know, these, these mature people about this, a spiritually mature People, well, I, I think we can, we can see a couple of reasons why he's specifically addressing fathers about assuring them that they've known Jesus, that which is from the beginning. First of all, it is, uh, he's addressing believers, or he's addressing fathers with just the understanding that what they have done all of their life has not been in vain. They have come to a familiar relationship And this faith, you know, that they have come to is uh, something that is real. You know, faith goes so far, but it is not sight. You know, and there are times in faith when even mature believers, the devil bangs on them. They wonder, have I wasted my life? You know, have I, uh, am I going the right direction, whatever? Perhaps the Holy Spirit is telling mature believers this so that they will rest in the fact that the one who they have been worshiping and following for these years of their salvation is the true one, is the only one. They have known him that is from the beginning. They have known the real Jesus, the one who is the God, the one who is God. They've known him. They've not been wrong. They've not been deceived. And our media is throwing out all this stuff. You know, this, you know the greatest height now is, is tolerance of all people if it works for you kind of thing. And, and, you know, if that religion works for you, great. If you find solace, what it's not. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Either he is the only Savior and the only God, or he's the biggest lunatic the world has ever known. He's a lying lunatic. And friends, he's not a lying lunatic. And so mature believers who've been saved many years, and they get, they, you know, most of these people were in pagan places. This was Turkey. This was early Turkey, the area we call Turkey now. And there's all kinds of different gods that were, were, uh, were celebrated or, and were worshipped, whatever. He says, he says, I assure you, you have known the one who's from the beginning, the creator, the only God. If you're on track, rest in that fact that you really know him who is from the beginning of time. And secondly, I think there's another reason here that he's saying this to this, these people in this stage of their Christian life. The second application is this. Like the Apostle John, who, who was older, an older Christian, you know, in physical years, probably many of the mature believers, because growing in the Lord takes time, probably many of the mature believers are older people, physically older people, not just spiritually mature. Many were facing the end of their life, and some of these people were even facing martyrdom, okay? They were chasing around Christians and killing them, right? By the way, that is happening in our world right now, too. Praise the Lord, not here in America. So as they're coming to the end of their life, they're facing the end of their life, they were thinking final thoughts of eternity. You know, there are some older people here and older senior saints that I've talked with that have made this a point of conversation or of counsel. You know, they're coming, you know, they're not even, they're not just talking about that they're going to die someday. They understand that it's probably going to be in the next couple years. And uh, however strong they are in the faith, there is this question mark. There's not, not a question mark. There is this understanding that they really are going to go through. It's not theory in a textbook anymore. They are really going through death. And perhaps John is saying, rest in the fact that you really have known Christ and that's enough. He is enough. You are prepared for death. When the end comes, he is enough. Rest in it. You're prepared. The one who you will soon meet, you have already known in this lifetime. 
He is the one that is from the beginning. He is the one that will be forever in eternity. You've already known him. When death comes and you stand before Christ, he's not going to be a stranger. He's going to be a friend. You've already known him. Rest in the fact that that is true and there is no fear. And I would encourage our senior saints here of that truth this morning. Of that truth this morning, you know Christ, and that is enough. Don't skits out in your as you stand in front of the valley of the shadow of death. It's easy for me to say, I understand, I'm not there. But do not fear death. Don't come unglued. Don't look for some other assurance. Don't doubt your relationship to Christ if you have trusted that he is the Savior who died for your sins and rose again. He is enough! He is enough! We're going to walk through that door and there's he going to be. He's going to brace you with open arms. He is enough. He is not a stranger. He is your friend. To spiritually strong and mature believers, the Lord says, be confident that you have known Jesus who's from the beginning. And then he goes to the, in reverse order, to the second stage that we go to in our Christian life, and that is young men. Look at verse 13 and 14. He says, the second part of 13, I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. And then look at 14. He says in the middle, I've written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. This word is an interesting word, uh, the background of it, the etymology. And it specifically had to do in physical years with a man who was approaching 40, but was not yet 40. He was under 40 years of age. So this is a guy in the prime of his life, physically. Spiritually, it applies to Christians of all ages. So he tells them twice that they have overcome the wicked one, Satan. And then he he tells them that they are strong and that the word of God abides in them. How how would a middle-aged believer... Not physical years, but someone who has been saved a while is growing in the Lord, okay, abounding in the Lord, growing. How would this apply to them? What is the Lord trying to tell us? These are believers who have been saved and growing. They, they, they know and are solid in the doctrines of the faith, of doctrine, doctrines of Scripture. They're not tossing around whether the, the major doctrines are true or not. They, they've settled that. They believe it. They've seen it in the Word of God. They're not swayed easily by heretical influences and voices from the world and all these crazy religions, whatever. The Bible says here they're strong, okay? They're solid in the faith. What do we need to understand when we're in this middle age Christian growth? Well, first, this, this group needs to understand that they have overcome the wicked one, the scripture says here, through Christ. So, so what does that mean? They, so the implication is that they shouldn't be yielding to, to the devil easily or, or fearing him anymore. They are beyond the little baby Christian temptations that knock a toddler down all the time. They should be beyond that, okay? They're, they're strong. They're there should be some constancy and stability by now. They, they know the major doctrines. They're solid in the faith. It's time for them to put away questions about the devil's system, for instance, controlling them that we're going to see in verse 15 when we preach the next sermon. It's time for them to stop, for the devil to stop holding their attention as if this was something good in this world and they didn't understand the truth. You know, babies are the ones who are enamored by rattles and giraffes that hang from mobiles over their cribs. That's a baby. Young men are well beyond that and should be well beyond that. You know, you probably think it's probably weird of one of our teenage guys if, uh, you know, one of the parents came to you and said, hey, can I talk to you? I know you've, been ha- you've had children. You know, I was just like, you know, we don't have any Pete's in our church, do we, teens? Pete's. You know, Petey, you know, I, I was, you know, I went into his room the other day and he was laying on his bed and I was kind of concerned about what he was doing. You're like, you're thinking all this stuff, bad stuff, whatever. You say, well, what, what was he doing? Well, he had this baby mobile. It was hanging from the ceiling. It had like elephants and giraffes. And he was going, oh, 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 oh and watching it go around. I would be concerned too. Okay, young men don't do that. They're not enamored by baby toys. This is the implication here. Maturing Christians should be well beyond being enamored by foolish materialism and fancy stuff and silly plush giraffes like Hollywood. I'm just, I'm just throwing out stuff, all right? Random stuff. Like, like Hollywood celebrities. 
and drunkenness and immodesty and pornography. This is baby stuff. We need to be strong and beyond you know, those rattles and giraffes that are spinning. They're obviously bad. They're obviously wrong. There should be babies falling to that stuff, not solid young men, not grounded young ladies in the faith and in the doctrines of the faith. Again, I'm just picking random devil stuff, but it's pretty accurate stuff. You've overcome that serpent when Jesus crushed his head at the cross. That serpent's a devil. Jesus made a show of him, the scripture says, openly triumphing over him and all principalities in that cross. He is whooped. He has received the fatal blow. He is being fitted for the coffin of eternal damnation. Do not be easily controlled by him, young men and young women of Christ. You are strong. Be strong. Verse 14 speaks of the strength of the young man stage. This is the prime of the Christian life. You know, you're not, you're not in discipleship classes anymore. You know, you're not wondering that the Bible has two sections in it, the Old Testament and the New Testament. You know, you're not, you, you're not deceived by simple heresies anymore. And the other implication of this other than not being enamored by the devil, is this is the time you're in your Christian prime to do something for the Lord if you're ever going to do it. If you're ever going to make your life count for the kingdom of God, it's in your prime spiritually. Probably many of the, I would would just say, maybe I'm wrong, I I don't think I'm wrong, but I think many of us in the congregation would fall into this category in what stage we are in. You know, the young man stage, spiritually. So what are you, what are you going to do for God in your prime here? I did not ask you about what you're going to do in your career. I did not ask you about your hobbies, your, your children's sports, your 401k, your retirement. I asked you, what are you going to do now that you're a, a solid Christian in Bible doctrine? You've overcome the wicked one through Christ's cross, and the word of God abides in you. Are you going to just sit there? Are you going to do something for Christ in your life? You're in your prime. I don't mean that in any sarcastic way, and I hope it doesn't come across to any visitors that I'm meaning this in some mean way. I I mean it inspirationally. I mean it because the Lord, the section, he says you're strong. Your pastor, believe in you and believe that through the Lord, because you're strong, you can do great things for the Lord. Who can you love? Who can you touch for the Lord? For Christ, what ministry can you make more excellent for him? You know, I I spent some time, um, I'm going to pick on him the second time in a sermon illustration, I picked on him, but Adam Formwald is taking over the, uh, or has, he has done our summer summer program for our children, led it for a couple of years, and uh, I talked to him about making that thing the most excellent he can for him, not winging it at all, but not just to a young man, I would say to you, with every ministry leader, every person that has anything that they're doing here for the Lord, let's do it with all our hearts excellently. We're in our prime. You know, we're strong, the scripture says, so do it for the glory of God. I'll just say this, okay? So Daniel Ruley was here, who was a youth in my youth group, and God works on a lot of things, and I got an opportunity to see him call to the ministry uh, going to Brazil on the mission field. I saw that. We went on a missions trip, took him on a missions trip, and he surrendered to go to Brazil. And now he is like, he's like a month away from going. He's thrilled. He's just coming full circle. And I took, put my arm on Adam uh, last Wednesday night and pointed to Daniel Ruley, and I said, those kids that you're about to minister to over in that, that midweek children's class, they are your Daniel Ruley. Like, he was mine. They are missionaries. They are, they are godly deacons. They're godly ministry leaders and ushers and pastors and pastors' wives and missionaries' wives, whatever, in your class. Raise them up for the Lord. Do the best that you can. Do kingdom work. It says here we are strong. You have such power since you are grounded in the word of God, young men in the faith and young women in the faith. You know that the gospel has power in your hands and in your mouth. You know Jesus is the truth of this world. So what are you going to do with that? 
And I would push you and I would challenge you and I would dare you to do something notable for Christ in your life. You are strong, the scripture says here. Attempt great things for God and expect great things from God. You are strong. What has been put in your hand to serve God or what do you need to look for to get in your hand to serve the Lord? Who can you love? Who can you serve? What can you do for the Lord? You say, Pastor, I don't feel strong. If you're grounded in the doctrines of the faith, you've come to know Christ as your Savior, you are strong. You can accomplish something worthwhile for the Lord. So have at it already. So stop thinking about what you're going to do for the Lord and start doing something for the Lord. You ever met folks like that? I, love, I don't want to be ugly. You ever met like that? Well, I feel like the Lord's going to do some great things for me. Okay, we'll be faithful now. Okay, let's have it now. Let's be strong now in whatever you can do for him now. And many believers have these great, it's, um, what's that guy's name, Walter Mitty? Is that who it is? You know, is that, yes? Help me, Walt. This, you know, these great expectations, these great imaginations of something out there wherever. The out there now is in the nursery. The out there is right now. And the, it's in being an usher. And the out there is right now. And going and swat and canvassing and, and, and being teaching a children's class. And, or whatever you can do, whatever you, however you get involved. The now is not sometime, some later. It's now. You're strong now. Be fruitful for the Lord now. Be strong. Stop whining and start winning. Stop vacillating and start living victorious. Stop making excuses and start being excellent. You are at your spiritual prime to expand the kingdom of Christ. So press on and do it. I'll never forget when John Candy died, the comedian. He was funny. I like to watch his movies, the clean ones. And uh, he was hilarious, you know. And I remember his eulogy, and I remember the news commentator, I don't know, it was NBC, Fox, I don't know what it was. And I remember, you know, the thing, John Candy has died. And the last, you know, it talked a little bit about the details, you know, health, blah, blah, blah. And the last thing it said is, he was a funny man. Is that really what you want me to say at your funeral? She liked cabbage. She liked to go to the beach. You know, you got only one life. It will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Young men, young women in the faith, solid in the doctrine, have at it. You are strong. The word of God abides in you. There's a third stage here that really is the first stage when you think about chronology, about a person getting saved. And that is a, a new believer or a immature believer. Little children. Look at verse 13. It says, I write unto you, the last part, I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. Okay, look at verse number 18. Little children is the last time. Okay, these are the same words that are being used here. So, new believers. We are privileged to, to have people in the house that have been saved in the last year or the last two years, and we have some that are here that you're wrestling over the gospel, and you're on the verge of accepting Christ. I think that's thrilling. That's exciting. You're being addressed here in these verses. The Lord assures baby believers that they have known the Father. They have known the Father. You say, well, isn't this just like what the mature believers were told? No, there's a difference here. It's almost like uh, what he says to mature believers, but the emphasis is on the last word. So it's not Christ, the one from the beginning. Here it's the word Father. You know Abba. You know the heavenly Daddy. I don't mean that disrespect. I mean it with all joy. Abba. It's telling little children in the faith, you just got saved, that they have a father, the assurance that they, they know him, that God is their father. He's not just the God of the sky. He's not just the creator. He's not just some, you know, clockmaker that started the, the clock and pushed the pendulum and then walked away from his creation. Through Jesus Christ, the veil has been ripped. The entrance has been given. You can come near to him. You can grab hold of him. The Bible says, come boldly to the throne of faith and find mercy and help in the time of need. The Bible says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh unto you. The Bible says, he has given us the power to call him Abba, Father, which is the Greek equivalent to Daddy. Talk with me. 
Okay, so I can call God Daddy? Some of you were in a generation where it wasn't the thing for daddies to say, I love you. It wasn't the thing for daddies to snuggle their children. And your daddies were a great generation, and they were strong, and they provided for the household and all of that. But you don't know what it means to have an Abba, Father. This, you know, the scriptures talk about a God that we can't, we don't only, we can't, we're not only right with him, he is, we are precious in his sight. We are precious children. He's given us inside of ourselves a Holy Spirit whereby we call him Daddy. And you new believers, how encouraged you need to be by that. You once were children, before you got saved, you were children of the devil. And the Bible says the lusts of him you would do. Now you got a different dad. You've been adopted and actually born again, both into the family of God. And you have an Abba. And when you cry by your bedside, he's holding you. He's there. He cares. He's touched with the feeling of your infirmities. He's your Abba. And when you have all these cares and burdens that are on you, he gladly says to you, casting all your care upon me, for I care for you. Imagine that. God who spread out the stars like marbles on a living room floor tells me to call him Father, Daddy. That will all come home the moment that we step on the shores of heaven. But it is true, young believers, right now. Newer believers in the room, you can rest in the fact that you have a daddy in heaven to talk to. Your daddy really hears your prayers and cares for you like a good daddy does. He protects you. He watches over you. He teaches you. He will never, ever let you go. He is your father. He's your Abba. You can cry to him. You can lean on him. You can embrace him and know he cares just like a young child would hold tight to their good father. You know, young children are insecure. I know a little bit about this. I've had five. Let's write a book. It's just a joke. You know, just because you have a lot of something or you've done it a long time doesn't mean you're good at it. I just said that like earlier in the sermon. But I do know that young children are, are, are insecure. A little baby, it's just learning to walk. You know, it always happens. It's like a disaster time. It's always, it always happens. Like you're, they're just starting to walk and they're going whatever and they're in church or whatever. Or they're in the nursery and the nursery lady swings around and knocks them into oblivion. Fortunately, the Lord made little children out of rubber, all right? They, ro- they go downstairs. I mean, it's amazing. They throw them against the wall. They come back to you. Back to you. There we go. It's true. The Lord protects. I think it's those, those guardian angels. They're like, oh, it's just, whoa, whoa. And that's true, too. That's a different sermon. Young children are insecure. They easily cry. They're unstable on their feet. It's very common for a new believer to be insecure also about whether they are really saved, about whether really God is their father, about whether he really cares for them and these kind of things. And it's not uncommon for new believers to to pray to be saved over and over and over. You know, like 10 times and maybe, and sometimes publicly, which whatever, they're they're insecure, they're unsure like a baby. Though I would say this, though I guarantee you new believers, little children, I guarantee you from the scriptural truth that God heard you the very first time that you called on the name of the Lord, that he wrote your name in the book of life, that you are his child, and that you don't need to do that over and over and over, that you can rest in Christ. It is true. You are eternally saved by trusting Christ alone. You cannot lose it just because of the insecurity that you feel in your heart. You don't need not to pray over and over and over. Rest in the truth of the gospel. Rest in your Father's arms. Your Abba will never let you go. Nothing, the scripture says, can pluck you out of his hand. You find something stronger than God, and I believe that you can lose your salvation. But he says you're in the palm of his hand, and nothing can pluck them out of my Father's hand. Rest in that. He really is your Father, and he forgave you all your sin once and all, once for all through Christ. John appeals, this last point here this morning, he appeals to little children in one other concern about being a new believer. Look at verse 18. I'm going to read, I'm going to read a couple of verses. We're not going to preach on it. I just want to make the point. So little children, and this is the same word. It's talking about new believers. It is, it is the last time. 
And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are, are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they would have been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they are not all of us. But you have an unction from the Holy One, uh, and you know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie, the lie of Antichrist, is of the truth. So I'm not going to preach this now, but he's talking, he's dressing one other thing in little children, and to these new believers specifically, to the paideia. He is warning them not to give any heed to false teachers, to antichrists. But those false teachers may sound good. And they may even have come out of a good church that you could point to or call themselves Baptists or whatever. But they are not teachers of the truth. In this example here, these were the Gnostics that deny that Jesus Christ had come in body. They said he was spirit and he never had a body. Okay? They're antichrists. And I would say this about antichrists, plural, false teachers. Verse 20 says that you have an unction or anointing from the Holy Spirit since you've been saved, new believers. Verse 27, 21 says you know the truth, and we would apply it this way. Do not be drawn away then by anything that is not like the truth that brought you to salvation or the truth that you've seen clearly from this pulpit or in your Sunday school room or or through a discipleship that someone came along with you. Don't be easily pulled away. And I'll say it this way, not all that glitters is gold. The cults are filled with people who have just professed Jesus Christ as Savior. It is a vulnerable, it is a thing, they're like, they're like babies, okay? They don't know the solid doctrines yet. And so cults swoop in, and they, they come to your door, and they, they say, can we have a Bible study together? Well, yeah, you know, I just got saved. I love the Bible. Great. I'll meet with you on Saturday, blah, blah, blah. And there it goes. Beware, little children. Pay Diaz, beware. Beware, beware of Antichrist. I exhort believers here that are still babies, though you've been saved Many years, you're vulnerable, waffling, easily influenced, easily offended, baby believers, carnal. But you're still childish. It's time to put away childish things and be a strong young man for God. It's time to grow, to commit yourself to the gospel you say you have believed. I'd end today by just saying praise God if And because you are growing in these stages, these three stages, it is proof of salvation. Be joyful and be assured in that. But also more specifically, be thinking of where you are. I wonder if I'd ask you to raise your heart, do you know where you are right now? Okay, I don't even know that that's a valid question. But you kind of know where you are. You know, as you are in the different stages of your Christian growth, apply the things specifically here that the Lord tells about each phase. Whether you are a mature father, a strong young man, or a little child in the faith. Would you bow your heads, please, across the room?